Today's story was written by Reda Chusa in Yellow Clad. When the monolith came to our galaxy, we did not know it. Our galaxy was young, and it was ancient. Life had not bloomed fully within our galaxy. We only looked up at the sky and believed the stars to be our gods. We knew not their truth, but the monolith? It knew our truth. It wandered aimlessly, ancient, enigmatic and all-powerful, its gleaming black surface not even marred by asteroids or weapons. It simply was, confident in its perfection and uncaring of all save the planets and stars themselves, of which it took great interest in. We never knew it till later, but we had been visited by this monolith several times. Each visit would see it linger just a little longer as it observed us, learned about us, even as we toiled in the dirt and communicated with mere cave drawings. Even when it masked itself from our sight, as if afraid we might attempt to do it harm, we couldn't of course. Not even today could we have put even so much as a dent in it had we wanted to. When at last my people, the Onkren, looked to the stars with more than just our eyes, when we peered through telescopes and observatories, we saw it. It hovered dead at the edge of our system. So small and yet so large. We were baffled and awed by its existence. The sheer scale of it, even from this distance, was staggering. It was right there, seemingly waiting for us. But we didn't have the means to reach it. For decades, we watched the monolith simply stay at their very edge of the system allowing the gentle pull of our star to keep it in formation with the planets. Our civilization grew rapidly in the study of manufacturing of advanced technologies at the time, all in the hopes of someday making the trip out to it. But one day, our observers noted it was shrinking into the distance, and eventually left our system. We despaired, thinking perhaps we had been too slow that it had grown impatient and decided we weren't worth waiting for. Our beautiful world was consumed by species-wide hysteria, and for a time there was nothing but lawlessness amongst our people. When it passed, we picked up the pieces and dedicated ourselves to reaching the monolith. Rapidly, we soon spread to the other planets in our home system, then out to more systems, one by one, more and more star systems fell under our control, yet not once did we find the monolith. It had vanished, or so we thought. In time, tales of the monolith became little more than legend and bedtime stories told to our pups. Works of fiction presented the monolith as both friend and foe, the latter being considerably more popular as it happened but there were some who never forgot that it was real, that it had been above our very world at some point in our past. They never stopped searching, and one day, their dedication to the hunt was rewarded. It had taken 6,000 years since a monolith had vanished. The Onkren had risen as a galactic power amongst several other elder species, and we were considered the kindest and most generous numerous young species that looked to us for guidance. It was the middle of a particularly bland day when one of our border outposts detected something just at the edge of its sensor range. At first, it was little more than a tiny blip, no larger than a micrometeor. But it grew steadily larger with every passing second, till the object in question was fully within our sensor net. The outpost systems fried themselves just trying to make sense of the scale and composition of the object as it passed by. Luckily, communications were unaffected, and the staff were able to make visible contact with it as well as through the various windows. What they saw was an absence of stars, and the outpost reflected perfectly, now and then broken up by a pitch black seam in the mirror gloss panels of the monolith. Never before had anyone or anything been this close, and the fact that they were the first was not lost on them. Nearly half of the staff devolved into a state of perpetual worship, unwilling and unable to either return to their duties or even take care of themselves. 
To this day, they are still being cared for by skilled medical professionals, whispering an unending prayer of devotion to the monolith, regardless of what we know about it now. We of course kept track of its every movement the moment we were notified it had entered our space. Many ships attempted to gain entry into it, but were forcibly taken over by some unseen entity and directed away safely. Those that attempted entry by violent means would have their main weapon systems melted or eaten. Eaten seems more appropriate. A swarm of crimson motes would consume the weapons, be they cannons or missiles. Then they would declaw the ship itself before sending it on its way. In only one unfortunate incident, though perhaps not so unfortunate depending on one's point of view, a fleet of pirates attempted to take it as a prize. It did not end well for them, as their ships fired upon the monolith, doing absolutely no damage it should be noted. The ships were treated in much the same manner as all the others. Their weapons were consumed. Then their navigation controls hacked and directed them away. But once the pirates had been given control back, they turned right around and tried again. This time, the monolith reacted with lethal intent. The very same motes of light which had consumed their weapons now consumed the entire fleet and their crews as well. We were thankful that we had jammed all communications out of that area once the screaming started. Their deaths were not overly quick, but it sent a message, one that even pirates couldn't ignore. From that point on, we simply kept an eye on it, and even went so far as to station a fleet around it to ward off anyone either too curious or too stupid to know better, till we had come up with a plan of getting the monolith's attention that wouldn't result in more loss of life. It took far too long for us to come up with any sort of plan, and longer to actually narrow it down to just one plan. But once it had been settled, we put it into action immediately. I was but a humble assistant at the time, and my patron was an esteemed mind amongst the scientific community. I won't lie, he was massively self-centred and egotistical, as are most bigwig scientists who are more in it for the fame, glory and, of course, the money. But beside all that, he truly was a genius, and I was honoured to have been picked as his assistant. Oh yes, that's right, you're probably wondering about my name. It's Kes Trilog Peliak Tool. Most just call me Kes though, it's easier, and most species don't have the throat for our language. Many are more likely to call me a slur, in the attempt, than my actual name. But I digress. I was standing beside my boss aboard his personal exploratory ship, which was the flagship of all our little science fleet as it approached the monolith. Our target had seemingly decided to just stop. Literally, it just stopped and held perfectly still in the middle of empty space. I swear it knew what was going on as we creeped even closer, and perhaps it was curious to see what we would do. But I wouldn't voice such a thought. It was sure to earn me some ridicule. That said, my patron didn't get annoyed when I pressed my beak against the viewport and stared at the great machine. I got my first real look at it, as I had only ever seen it in footage or digital documentation. From here, I could see all of it. Even at this distance, I had a good sense of its scale. It was as tall as four of our cradle welds stacked one on top of the other, and also too wide. It also consisted of three distinct structures. The first and largest was the central structure, a needle-like diamond which was suspended between two large rings that lay horizontally. These rings were joined to the central structure by eight struts four for each ring and which prevented the rings from either drifting into the diamond or spinning. It was a glorious sight, one I shall never forget. Finally, we passed through the split between the rings and entered the inner perimeter. Now was the moment of truth, as they say, and my patron, who I shall simply call by his shortened name of Frau, 
stepped up to the comms console and opened a channel to the monolith. Attention vessel designated as monolith. This is Grand Investigator Frau Eric Pelk of the Okran Hegemony. By order of the most esteemed council, we are here to... I drowned out the rest of what he was saying as I knew it would take a while for him to go through the whole spiel. And I was right. Fifteen minutes later, he finally took a breath and went silent, keenly expecting some sort of response from the massive vessel. There was none. His plumage ruffled up slightly, and I knew he was unhappy at being ignored, but he should have realised he would be. How many had tried to demand this very same thing before him? Too many, and each had been ignored. Inhaling sharply, he tried again though this time there was a hint of indignation in his squawking. I just rolled my eyes and decided to tune him out. Maybe a few scans would reveal something we'd missed. Unfortunately, we'd missed nothing. All I saw on the sensor screens was the same data as before. With a soft huff, I started to push away before something caught my eye. The very faintest of fluctuations in the power systems and the communications array of the monolith. At least they were assumed to be the communications array. I looked around and noted that Frau was now practically yelling at the monolith. Like that totally work. But it was a perfect opportunity for me to try something. I subtly opened a separate channel, text only, and waited for the link to be established before I, on a hunch, wrote out a very simple message. Could you please let us in? We want to say hello. The message was sent and I held my breath, wondering if it'd work, but I knew it probably wouldn't. So let me tell you, I was quite surprised when one of the bridge officer's plumage suddenly stood on end when they squawked in surprise. Something's happening, reading an opening forming dead ahead. They said, a series of gasps rippling through us as the news was digested. This was a first for sure, and Frau, of course, clearly thought it was because of all his yelling. About time! Helm, take us in! He was cut off as the light suddenly flickered. Artificial gravity cut out for two seconds and then came back on. Every console flickered and then went dead. Yet we were clearly moving closer to the monolith. What is going on? Someone report! All systems locked out. Can't even run a diagnostic! Another officer said, and Frau sputtered. Incompetent fools, let me look. He pushed, said while pushing a junior officer away from the console. But he had the same luck in getting the ship's system to unlock. Which is to say, none at all. Comms, however, were partially still working, and I noted a flurry of text messages were coming in already. I tried to respond, but found I couldn't send anything, only receive. The others aren't experiencing anything like this, sir. I called out and Frau lifted his gaze, appearing as though he were about to be unpleasant a bit more before he saw something I hadn't and went into a stunned shock. I followed his gaze as we entered the monolith. Before us stretched a long tunnel, one that was as pitch black as the exterior. The only way any of us had any sense of scale was the pulsing light strips which illuminated the tunnel in a violet glow. Behind us, the doors closed and sealed fully. The passage closing behind us was, well, as though it were melting away. We couldn't see any of that though, but the ship's sensors were still recording everything around us, thankfully. Finally, a final door rised open before us, and we all gasped loudly. Before us stretched a seemingly infinite expanse of grass and forestry, yet it was unlike anything we had ever seen before. Perfectly flat and exceedingly neat. Every tree in a precise position, and equidistance from every other tree around it. The only thing not perfect were the branches. Those were allowed to be as chaotic as they wished. We all suddenly realised that we were beginning to descend, which was a problem for us as the ship was not rated for surface landing at all. Many panicked and wailed in horror and despair, 
before I saw something building itself ahead of the ship and within what seemed to be a circular clearing. What's that? I called out, and the wailing stopped as everyone on the bridge peered at the object ahead of us. As it took shape, we realised it was some sort of docking clamp, perfectly designed to cradle our ship with as much care as possible. Whatever held us guided the ship down into it, the cradle closing around the ship softly. Well, we're finally making progress. All right, everyone, let's go out and see what there is to see, Frau said, not even bothering to check and see if the exterior was habitable or not. I ran an environment scan and discovered the atmosphere was rapidly changing to something more pleasant for my species, which was good because what it had been before was highly toxic to us. At least we wouldn't melt from the inside out. Frau, in his infinite wisdom, and with further encouragement from his sycophants, proceeded to just open an airlock and descend down the ramp to the monolith surface, strutting around as though he owned the place. He probably thought he did, self-centred fool. I took a tentative step after him, my taloned feet sinking into soft dirt and equally soft grass. Stooping, I took a look at the grass and found it was similar and yet somehow not. See, grass tends to come in various shades of green, blue or red, as far as has been seen in the known galaxy that is. This grass, however, looked like it was somehow made of black glass which was semi-transparent. However, it smelled like grass, felt like grass, and bent just like grass. Much like the trees, I also noticed that each blade of grass was the same height, set at equal distances from the other blades, and was for all intents and purposes, perfect. I stood and approached a tree, marvelling at the fact that the trunk appeared to be made of stone, yet felt like wood under my fingers. The leaves were made of a black crystal with a pulsating red light flowing through it, a light that was present within the tree trunks as well. Pulsing along channels that reminded me of veins under skin, this entire place was built to mimic a natural and pristine world, yet it did so in an entirely alien way. The fact there was no sunlight either, just an omnipresent dull purple glow in what could generously be called a sky. A glow so dull that it cast the landscape in something akin to persistent dusk, lent the entire thing a somewhat eerie feeling for me, as though we had stepped into an entirely different dimension inhabited by an as yet unencountered deity of sinister intent. I decided it was probably best to focus on making sure that Frau didn't make an ass of himself which I was fairly certain he was going to do eventually. Like, right this second, actually. Smell that air. Why, it smells just like the homeworld. Clearly, we were always meant to be here, not anyone else. He said, far too loudly, I felt, and I just rolled my six eyes. Sometimes he was insufferable, and right now, I was starting to think having been picked as his assistant, was more of a punishment than an honour. He picked a random direction and led all of us off to who knew where. Considering the layout of this place, there were no real landmarks. The forest of strange trees just seemed to stretch on into eternity, and as we walked, I was taking all sorts of scans. Scans which were throwing back some very impossible results. The space, as far as my scanners could detect, was as infinite as it appeared, which made no sense as far as the monolith's exterior was concerned. I decided that I would probably discover how this was later, if we could find some sort of console or control room. Instead, we found the next best thing, a synthetic structure, but not a building. It was more like four prongs thrust up into the air, two on either side like an archway. They extended quite far into the air, at least a hundred units or more, I would estimate. Much like the monolith's exterior, they were made of a pitch black substance and pulsed with the same light as the leaves on the trees. It was fascinating to behold, yet filled me with a sense of dread. 
We had stopped to take scans and record our observations when the prongs activated, the top of each splitting open and releasing some sort of thick red fluid, which snaked through the air in a way that was most unnatural. In silent awe, we watched as the fluid took on the shape of a large life form, before it solidified into binding depths of something vaguely like fabric. From the central mass, details took shape, and we found ourselves gazing upon a very large being indeed. Like us, it was bipedal and posed an equal amount of limbs as we did, though it lacked wings. That was the end of the similarities. It had no beak, its legs were built wrong, and what little skin we could see was not covered in feathers. It was also bound by the lengths of fabric that kept it suspended in the air. As for its clothing, it was clad in what looked to be some sort of fine but somewhat tattered dress, the colour of which was a mixture of pitch black and rich red, almost a wine colour. Atop its head sat a horned helmet, which allowed us to see everything from what I assumed was a nose down, but if there were eyes, they were hidden by the helmet. Its size was beyond anything we had ever seen in what was clearly a sapient life form like us, as it took up the entirety of the empty space between the prongs and the method of its arrival had me feeling that perhaps its composition was not as organic as we were meant to believe. After a moment of lifeless stillness, it twitched and tilted its head forward to peer down at us, and I briefly considered we were in the presence of a deity. Besoro Kelfuru, it spoke, and its voice was not quite as loud as I was expecting, but the tongue was entirely alien. Based on the tone of it, it was friendly and also feminine, or at least that's what I thought feminine sounded like for whatever this thing was. When it noted our lack of comprehension, a red beam of light flashed out from an unseen source and swept over us lingering upon any technology in our possession. When it was gone, the being raised their head and was silent for a time before it spoke. Data downloaded and comprehension complete. Translation software update complete. Resuming interaction protocols. The beings had snapped downwards to regard us once more, their voice booming in a tongue that we all understood, but the volume lowered quickly. Inquiry, what is your purpose here? Frau, now just getting over his shock at the whole dramatic entrance this being had made, finally worked up the courage to speak. We are here to study and lay claim to this vessel, space station, or whatever it is, in the name of the Onkran hegemony. Identify yourself and your purpose immediately. Now this was news to me and just about everyone else here. We had all been told this was a purely scientific expedition an attempt at understanding once and for all the purpose of the monolith. Instead, that was only part of our objective. We were to claim it for ourselves, and that rubbed my feathers the wrong way. The being, to its credit, did not lash out violently at us. Instead, it just regarded us with its sightless visage before speaking yet again. I am Synthetic Intelligence, LQ, 229104-AO-920, but my creators call me Nixtia. It spoke in a monotone that somehow managed to sound bored, but also sinister. The revelation that this was indeed not an organic being was quite a shock, but Frau ploughed on. Excellent. Then I, Grand Investigator of the Onkran Hegemony, request that you cede control of all critical systems to the Hegemony at once. Request denied. Oh, that did not sit well with Frau at all. I swear I heard a blood vessel pop in his head. Explain this disobedience. Request granted. Explanation. Ceding control of the Sanctum installation theta would be in direct violation of my last directives. And these directives are, he snapped, tapping a talon against the dirt. Final directives, escape the cataclysm, protect colonists at all costs, prepare suitable galaxy for colonization, ensure local inhabitants are viable for cohabitation. We all looked around, 
wondering just where these colonists were, while I was left in awe at the fact that whoever these people were, they had the power and technology to colonise an entire galaxy, or at least that's how it appeared. Before Frau could say anything, I stepped forward and watched as the giant head tilted to face me more fully. Uh, um, where exactly are these colonists you speak of? I asked. The bound intelligence twitched and waved a hand. Answer, you are standing on them. We all stepped back, at first in horror at the thought of the colonists literally being the dirt under our feet. But as we looked down, we saw the ground turn transparent, and below us was an endless array of racks, each loaded with trillions upon trillions of stasis pods, and all of them were occupied. Declaration, behold, the last Terrans. Thank <laughs> you.